Hi guys! Reef aquariums attract not only with the impressive corals, but also with the richness of fish, which add color and dynamics to the reef tank and allow you to observe their behaviors and habits. By the way, marine aquaristics started from fish keeping, not coral keeping. And although we often hear about marine tanks with only fish, reef tanks with corals alone are much rarer. And it is surprising that many aquarium hobbyists seem to neglect the fish, limiting the care to acclimatization after the purchase and then feeding them once a day. In today's episode, I wanted to share with you some of my thoughts on feeding the fish. Enjoy! Fish, like all living organisms, must eat food to satisfy the demand for macronutrients providing energy and building materials, as well as microelements and vitamins ensuring proper metabolism. Fish, as animals, have to find this food, and in nature they do so in many ways. The largest predatory fish, such as sharks, hunt for smaller fish, but they will not turn down carcass either. In extreme cases, some shark species can feed once every few months. Smaller predatory fish hunt much more often. After a whole day spent hiding in the rocks, they go out in the evening to hunt for less careful fish. In home marine aquariums, you are unlikely to find typical sharks, although you can find fish that are predatory uh, by definition, for example lionfish or smaller morays. These fish require an appropriate diet and the aquarium hobbyist must be aware of their requirements and the risk they pose to other aquarium inhabitants. Fish that feed on plankton adopt other feeding strategies. As soon as the first rays of sunshine illuminate the reef, they come out to catch small zooplankton from the water. They will do so until the evening when, in fear of predators, they will hide in the corners of the rock waiting until dawn. There's a lot of these fish in the aquarium. This group includes popular anthias, damselfish, chromis, or even clownfish. These are examples of fish that are very eager to eat live food, frozen food or flakes in the aquarium because such food reminds them of plankton suspended in the water. Interestingly, in some situations, this group of fish living in a tank may be joined by fish that in nature look for food in completely different places, for example, rasses or even mandarin fish. On the reefs, they feed on small crustaceans walking on the rocks, while in the aquarium they can take a regular interest in frozen food. Most herbivorous fish also feed regularly during the day. And if they do not live in typical biotopes with marine plants, they often graze on algaemos growing on rocks or sand. This is what, for example, parrotfish do. They bite the top layer of rock with the sharp, beak-like teeth. Interestingly, together with the algae, they swallow small fragments of the rock with everything that lives on it. Typically, herbivorous fish are rare in aquariums. As a rule, most of them can be omnivorous, even in nature, although they may actually prefer plant food when they have a choice. In aquariums, such examples include tanks and, uh, for example, fox faces, which will eagerly eat algae. However, if there is no permanent access to plant food, they can, but they don't have to, switch to substitute food, such as frozen food or dry food. I have two tanks in my tank, the yellow one is omnivorous. It regularly scraps off the rock and rare glass, but willingly accepts other foods. The blue one, only now, after three months, slowly starts to take interest in substitute food. Of course, there are also plenty of fish that have specific diets in nature, such as mussels, slugs, coral polyps, and so on. All of them if they end up in an aquarium, may have problems to switch to substitute food 
and it is very possible that in some cases they will not get rid of their innate dietary habits. These fish include popular butterfly fish, for example, copperband or threadfin butterfly. Both fish, even if they will easily take replacement food, may be interested in mussels or LPS coral polyps. Interestingly, their natural instinct can be inactive for several years. I know an aquarium where a copper band ate Tridacna in one day despite not touching it for three years. But why am I telling you about it? Because in typical domestic marine aquariums, there is practically no chance of a constant and natural supply of live food. And in the vast majority of cases, fish that do not switch to substitute food will eventually starve to death. The solution here may be feeding them with live food, shots with live copper pods, or using refugium or algae filters. Because in systems where small crustaceans can safely reproduce, we will not only increase biodiversity, but also provide live food that does not pollute the water while it is alive. Here, by the way, we touch uh, on two aspects of fish nutrition. Firstly, a healthy diet that is providing all the required nutrients and secondly, appropriate dietary strategies tailored to the specific fish species. Well, but what are the nutrients? The easiest way to divide them is into organic or in and inorganic. Uh, plants, for example, can turn some inorganic substances into organic ones, which not only give energy for growth, but also material for building tissue. Unfortunately, animals, including fish of course, cannot do it and must acquire organic substances such as protein, fats, sugars, vitamins and minerals from food. However, they can turn one organic substance into another. On reefs, Fatty acids are the main energy source. However, marine fish can only digest unsaturated fatty acids or of plant origin or from another marine organisms. It's the same with protein. Fish easily assimilate proteins from other fish, shrimps or plants, but protein from, for example, mammals is much more difficult to absorb. When it comes to vitamins and microelements, Fish are able to absorb them directly from the water column, but this is an inefficient uh, process and it is much better when fish get food and rich in vitamins and microelements. My point is that when keeping fish in an aquarium, we have to provide them with food rich in assimilable nutrients. And forget about the uh, inventions I sometimes read about, uh, like shredded chicken breasts or chicken hearts. As far as nutrition strategies are concerned, they must of course be adapted to specific fish. If we have herbivorous fish, we have to give them access to algae. If we cannot provide life form from, for example, a refugium, we can use dried nori algae instead, or we can uh, use dry food enriched with spirulina. Adapting the feeding to the lifestyle of the fish is extremely important, precisely because of the evolutionary adaptations. For example, fish with long digestive systems will be able to eat to the full and then not feed for a while. Fish with short digestive tract uh, must be fed several times a day. If you have fish feeding at night, you have to feed them at night or at least in the evening. As far as I can remember, freshwater aquarium systems were dominated by live and dry foods. Maybe that has changed uh, today, but I'm not really up to date with the issue. In marine aquaristics, frozen food is most popular. I will not talk about the nutritional value or ordinary uh, or even enriched artemia, because there are um, uh, plenty of scientific, scientific studies of this subject available on internet. I wanted to mention here um, a rather still unpopular food such as various dry granules and flakes. Um, I started using tropical marine power dry food nearly two years ago and I can confidently um, uh, speak about its 
advantages and disadvantages. And I will start with the most important advantages of using dry food in marine aquarium, in my opinion. First of all, uh, it is a food that basically has no waste. Everything that is in, in flakes or granules uh, has nutritional value. And their composition is designed speci specifically for marine fish. They contain not only proteins or unsaturated fatty acids, but also vitamins, uh, amino acids and trace elements. This translates um, not only into the condition of the fish, but also into the water quality. Because by giving highly nutritious food, we can give smaller portions, which is important in case of high nitrates or phosphates in water. The second uh, advantage is the readiness for use. No need to defrost, rinse or anything. You just take a pinch and drop into the water. This makes frequent feeding much, much easier and is of uh, great importance for fish that eat plankton all day long in nature. For example, popular anthias. This fish, fed only once a day with low quality food, will slowly starve to death. The next thing is availability uh, and efficiency. You don't have to keep it in the fridge and even a small pack is enough for much longer than one pack of frozen food. And of course, there's a lesser chance that you're going to run out of food during the weekend. This is of of uh, a serving uh, uh, translates into convenience when the aquarium is looked after by a neighbor during your holiday because he or she does not have to bother with uh, towing or rinsing the frozen food. But the dry food has also some disadvantages which I'm going to tell you about now. Firstly, many fish will not switch to the dry food overnight. For example, um, I never had problems with flakes and most of my fish started eating them very quickly, but they had to use to the granules for a few weeks. I needed to mix them first with frozen food and let the, the, the flavors of both foods uh, permeate. And the beginning, uh, I also had to soak the granules uh, with water for a bit longer to soften them because some, especially uh, smaller fish, um, could spit it out. Uh, the second thing is that some fish, for example, uh, pipefish or mandarin fish, uh, are unlikely to switch to granules or flakes at all. In this case, we must keep giving them the right food they know uh, and accept. The next thing is that uh, dry food must be applied into the water, not on the surface, because it will float and eventually uh, flow off to the sump. And this is because marine fish are reluctant to eat food from the water surface. Tropical Company has a whole series of dry foods with excellent biochemical parameters, so I encourage you to get to know the offer. I hope I brought you a little closer to the topic of feeding fish in the aquarium. I encourage you to get your fish used to the dry food, even if not as a basic diet, and only to diversify it. And it is always a good idea to have flakes or granules at hand and use them regularly to make sure that your fish gets all the necessary uh, nutrients. That's all for today, and I hope you like this episode. If you have any questions, please leave the comments, and please subscribe to this channel because the next episode is coming soon. Take care and see you later.